But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard of? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed in our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 17 and verse 21. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. How beautiful are the feet of the messenger of good news. These words are from Isaiah's prophecy concerning the restoration of Jerusalem, which is found in chapter 52 of his sayings. And immediately after that is one of what are called the servant visions in which Isaiah says that the Messiah will suffer. Now, in his vision, the messenger of good news triggers a celebration. Behind him are coming the exiles that are returning from a period of oppression. They will join with the people who stayed in the land, and together they will rebuild the city. They'll rebuild their nation, and it will be better than it was before. They'll rebuild on the foundations, but with the wisdom and the faithfulness that comes from going through the refining fire of a period of hard times. A part of God's hardwiring of our hearts and our minds is that we rebuild on the foundation of our lives and we incorporate that our new experiences, our new wisdom in that rebuilding. And for that reason, it is generally better than what was before. Now, for most of us, we get our foundations on the knees of our mother or our grandmother or another woman who cared for us as children. They taught us and encouraged us and prayed for us. We watched them <coughs> and we learned. And we laughed and we played as, as we learned and we prayed. We know from childhood that the new stage of life rebuilt on the old is even more adequate for the life that we're living now than what once was. You know, it's good to crawl, but it's even better to walk. And so it goes through all of the stages of our life. But going through life is not easy for children. You know, we object to being told to take a bath, brush our teeth, do our homework, and all that other good stuff. Clean up your room. Take out the garbage. You know, all that stuff that parents tell us to do. A wise friend of mine said one time that the God-given role of parents was to disrupt their children's good time. And children object. We objected, our children objected, grandchildren object, our friends' children object, people object. So what's a child to do? They feed us, we're small, we need them. We develop, among other things, selective hearing. And it works, kind of, to deal with the frustration of being in a dependent relationship on another person. Now, there's an old joke about a mom whose son was a master of selective hearing. He was about ready, to get, about ready to get his first paycheck, so mom sat him down and talked to him about long-term thinking and about money and responsible behavior and gave him the Save for College pep talk. 
Well, he'd worked hard for a whole two weeks for his first paycheck. So when Junior comes home, he has this new stuff for his game setup. Mom says, I talk and I talk and you just don't hear. And Junior says, hey, I'm so glad you like my new gear. Yep, <laughs> we've been there, haven't we? Well, moms are not the only one with this sort of problem. God has it with us. In Israel, in Paul's day, had developed selective hearing. As he wrote in verse 21, but of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and a contrary people. Why does God hang in there with us? You know, human beings are not an easy deal, and God has to be tempted just to walk away. However, the Bible makes it clear that God will try everything at least once, maybe twice or three times to get through to us. Then, if all else fails, he'll step back and allow us in our freedom to learn the hard way. This is not God's preference. It's what we insist on. Though he steps back, he never abandons his children. My friends, we have all been there one way or another. Perhaps we saw a new hire at work whom we liked, but they opened their mouth and they just said things we knew were going to get them in trouble. Perhaps, and I hope you did, perhaps we had the love and the wisdom and the courage to take them aside and to clue them in. You know, sometimes people do hear them. They say thank you, and they stay out of trouble, and that's just wonderful. And even if they get in trouble, at least we've done everything we can. It makes it easier to be for them, to be there for them when they wise up. But sometimes people just keep on keeping on. We hate to see it. We know that trouble is coming for them. We know it's completely unnecessary. But we care about them anyhow. See, caring is one thing. Allowing others their freedom is another. Ever have a friend that just didn't get it in some important area of their life? Perhaps your friend was a bad picker when it came to romance. They might have a great car, they might have a great career, but they just weren't a good picker when it came to men or women. Just romantically, I bet you've seen that. See? People's heart want to believe that some things are true. And it makes it very hard for them to hear stuff that doesn't fit with what they want to believe. As Paul said 2,000 years ago, hey, they just didn't get it. I think that's what Paul said. Because we care about people, because they are, they are our sisters and our brothers in Christ, we really need to ponder how God loves and how God has loved us. So we can love others the same way. As Paul considers the future of Israel in the light of Jesus Christ, he said he saw that God hoped that Israel would see the joy the Gentiles had in experiencing the God of Israel, and that because of what they saw, they would come to embrace the truth. Salvation depends on grace, and we will never get there by being good enough. Many listened, even in Paul's day. Many didn't. But Paul was right. This process of jealousy leading to wisdom continues. 
of the approximately 800,000 to a million observant Jews in America today, there are about 200 to 250,000 Messianic Jews. They're people who are, are Jewish faith. Many of them of their Jewish heritage. They're the, the physical descendants of Abraham. And they've come to accept Yeshua. That's Jesus' Jesus's Hebrew name, Yeshua. God saves is what the beautiful name means. They worship Yeshua. The logic of God's love that Paul saw continues even today. If they won't get it the easy way, we'll let them experience life the hard way. And perhaps when they see the witness of a life well lived, they may become jealous, but it may lead them back. Now, this logic of stepping back and allowing people to learn, but giving them the witness of a life well lived, applies in many, many areas of life. If people will not listen, just step back and allow them to learn by doing. For example, our life well-lived is the most powerful gift that we that we can give to people who are headed for trouble and they just won't hear really many of us have old friends or children or grandchildren living lives that are fun today and trouble tomorrow and we just know how this is going to work out Many of us have people we care about in our lives who will not listen to God or to us or to common sense or to their own experience. Our hands are outstretched to them. Of course they are. They turn away. They will not hear. Oh, this is never easy. It's a part of many people's life right this moment. And I think it's been a part of most everybody's life at some moment. What I think is that we don't always see that what we have been through is preparation to be God's person with those who are going through it now. You see, when we care about somebody who won't listen, it's very much like God reaching out his hand to those who have no interest right now in taking it. The most powerful gift that we can give in a situation like this is the example of a life well lived. But they continue, and that is a burden. It is hard. Our focus is usually on the person who is headed towards trouble. But God asks us also to take a look at the person who's doing the loving, who's trying to do the right thing, who's hanging in there with a colleague, with a child, with a neighbor. Who knows that love is worth it, but right now may be wondering, really? Wouldn't it just be easier to walk away from it all? Well, yes and no. Because when we do the right thing, when we're a witness to the truth, even if it turns out badly, at least we've done everything we can. And there's powerful comfort in that. And so we need to help our friends. We need to help our family members. We need to help the people at work who are trying to do the right thing. Because it's hard. And because we are positioned by God to love them with the love they need. See, what we need to do is to allow ourselves to remember when <laughs> someone, probably our mother, was reaching out their hand to us 
and we weren't taking it. We need to remember why we didn't take it. Because we need to understand in any of these situations what's going on. And we can't understand it if we don't allow ourselves to know what we know. But if we allow, allow ourselves to know what we know, we can be God's person and bring great comfort. And you know, we've been that parent, we've been that friend, we've been that supervisor, we've been that colleague reaching out and giving our heart to someone who just doesn't want to hear right now. And in love, we learn to tolerate the discomfort of remembering our own discomfort when we were in that situation so we can go and sit and be with them and encourage them and strengthen them while they're trying to do the right thing. This love is so like, like our mother's love sitting with us. I encourage you this next week to love another in their need, of course, but to love another especially who is trying to do the right thing. And maybe it's driving them a little nuts, or maybe their heart is downcast. This is a hard ministry. You've been there, and you can sit with them, and you can pick them up, and you can encourage them to do the right thing. They can use company, God's company, and your company. So give your heart, like Christ gave it to us, to someone you know who is struggling with a child, a friend, or a colleague who's headed for trouble and won't listen. Just love them in Christ's name. Just lift them up. God bless you, and I know that you will. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, some of our ministries are fun, but not all of them. But we know the weight and we know the struggle. And so open our eyes to those around us who are trying to do the right thing and who need a friend to sit beside them, to put an arm around them, and to encourage them to do the right thing. In Christ's name, amen. carried me through life she told me about Jesus and how he died for me she taught me many scriptures I still quote from memory when I climbed down to run and play as children
verses.